Okay, right. So there, um, in front of you, you should actually have the following two documents. Uh, this was emailed to the school, and you can see it on your uh, screen as well. Um, there it is, the tele-tutor, and oh, yeah, the tele-tutor over there. Um, we're going to explain to you very, very briefly how it works, because this is basically going to be um, the all the lessons that all, all the classes that we're going to be doing, you will see it um, straight away on your cell phone. Then the other document that we're going to have or that you need to use is this one. Um, like it as if I need a full person. Okay. Sorry about that. It is the revision mind map. Now, this is also I find very, very handy because it gives you a very, very brief summary of everything that you will be doing in the sections uh, that we're going to be covering today and on Friday. Right. So let's have a look at your tele tutor quickly. Now, I think most of you are very savvy with your cell phone. Uh, a lot more than what I am. So when you use your uh, tele tutor, you will see uh, there is a barcode at the bottom. So if you turn your page around, okay, we're going to start with climate. And if you can see it over there, right at the top, uh, you will see there is a barcode. Now, what you need to do is the following. You actually need to take your cell phone and you have to place it over that barcode over there. And then you have to move it forwards and backwards. And then you will see when it uh, click on it, it will give you a figure and then you will click on it, play. And then this whole section over there will come in and you can see what we are doing over here, um, that will be exposed over there. Right now, obviously, if you are a little bit uh, not tech savvy as me, uh, you would obviously have to try and practice this, and then eventually it will go on. What is nice about this section over here is that with each of our different sections that we are doing, you will see there is a barcode. So if you've gone through the work and you still don't understand it, then you can go to that barcode over there, click on it, right? Try and open it and see what the person is explaining if you understand that a lot better. Okay, all right. So uh, again, it's a bit of practicing. And with the practicing, you will be able to actually see all the different sections of your tele um, tutor that we've got over here. Right. Right. So now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to quickly go through your paper one. Right. So when we're going to do paper one, um, paper one this year will consist of your physical geography. Now, the physical geography will be climatology and geomorphology. And when we're going to look at the uh, climatology, which we're going to be covering today, will be um, on the following subject, on, on, on the following topics. Um, can you give me a can you my diet more? Awesome. Right. So when we're going to do the uh, paper one, we're going to focus in climatology, number one, on mid-latitude cyclones. Now, actually very, very interesting to know that currently we are experiencing a proper, proper mid-latitude cyclone. In actual fact, over the last two weeks, we've had it on and off. And it showed us a very, very good idea about what a family of mid-latitude cyclones actually consist of. All right. 
So then our second topic is tropical cyclones, something that we don't experience here in South Africa very often because we don't have the right conditions for it. I always joke with my class and I say to them that I will put my whole salary on, on the floor and that if we ever have a tropical cyclone here in table view, uh, then it will be quite a miracle. So tropical cyclones, not something that we here in the West Coast will experience often, um, but on the East Coast of South Africa, we sometimes have the effects of it. Right, then uh, topic number three, high pressure systems, something that you've done last year in grade 11, and, and I'm sure your teachers have, your educators have explained to you about the influence of the South Atlantic high pressure, the Kalahari high pressure, and the South Indian high pressure, and how these different pressure systems change their position according to the seasons. So, and that also explains to us why we have a very, very hot summer, but also a very wet and cold winter. Right, then something, our next topic is the line thunderstorms. The line thunderstorms, if you're from the Transvaal or Gauteng, you will be familiar with that in, during summer. Also quite spectacular um, to see it, but also very frightening. Then our next one, Berg winds. Berg winds currently at the moment, and if any of you watched the news last night, you would have seen that um, there are raging fires over certain parts of South Africa where lots of animals and people have lost property. So a very, very important part uh, of our South African climate. And then our next one, synoptic weather map. And as I said, uh, there is certain things. If you look at the synoptic weather map, you can actually decide, uh, plan your party for the weekend, and you can be very clever and show your mom and dad that you've actually learned something at school um, and say, listen, you can go ahead and plan my party for the weekend because we're going to have pretty good weather, right? Then our next one is valley climate. Um, interesting. It is a climate on its own. Uh, and that is also one of the sections, valley climates, that can come up in the um, in your map work section. Right, and then our last one that we're going to be covering in climatology will be urban climate. But uh, interesting, if you are staying in town, especially here in Cape Town, and you go into town during summer, and you will see that if you walk up down, up and down Adderley Street or one of the side streets, it's normally very stuffy there. And then you go on to wherever you live, like for instance, I stay in Tableview, uh, the temperature changes very drastically. So we will see how that uh, differ. Right, and then uh, that is what we're going to be covering in climatology. Geomorphology we will be doing a Friday, and um, I'm not going to spend much time because on Friday we will go through the, again, the concepts, different types of rivers, and so forth, and so forth. Right, then uh, another point that is very, very important that we need to know is how are your papers going to be set? Right, so paper one will be your geography, uh, which will be your climatology and your geomorphology. And then uh, part of the section of this paper one will be your map work. Very interesting uh, for the educators, please. Um, I just asked um, Mrs. Prince the other day uh, about the maps. You will be asked two different maps. Um, so also what is important that we need to remember is that when we ask some calculations in the first paper, it won't be repeated in the second paper. So paper one, 30 marks on um, climatology 
oh, sorry, 60 marks on climatology, 60 marks on uh, geomorphology, and 30 marks on map work. So boys and girls, uh, it is important that we need to know, and we're going to go through quickly to show you what are the map work skills that you need to know. All right, so that is paper one, climatology, geomorphology, map work, application, interpretation, and your obviously very, very important is your GIS, right? And uh, just a little tip, if you can remember this, is that when you do your GIS, make sure that you know your concepts very, very well. If you know your concepts, it will make it much, much easier for you to go and when they ask you the interpretation, how to apply your concepts to the work that they ask you. So that is a very, very important thing that you need to remember for grade 12 GIS. Right, so let's go through the map work skills quickly. So map work skills, um, again, number one, Direction and bearing, something that we've done since grade eight. Um, direction and bearing, again, there's a difference. Um, direction, it gives you a vague idea. I always say to my kids, if I want to know where, and I point my finger and I say, where do you stay? Over there, right? Otherwise, if I want to be saved, and I will have to give you um, specific locations and that is where your bearing comes in but our next one that we need to know is your contour lines right and this is a very very important thing is height on a topographical map and this is i always say that when you look at a map you interpret a map according to color and one of the things that I always say is that when your map is lots of brown, there's lots of brown lines on it, okay, what does that mean, okay? First of all, it means that when these lines are very close together, it means something. So what does it mean? It means it's a steep landscape. So if I want to go and build something over there, that might be a little bit of a problem. Okay, so to identify height, what do we need? We need contour lines. We need trick beacons. We need spot heights. And we need benchmarks. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of this. So when you do the um, when you do map work, make sure that you know two things out of the hut. Number one, how to read a trick beacon. Okay. We try and catch you many, many times. I do it and I sneak in a little triangle in there and I ask them under gradient and then they give me the wrong number and then boof, bang, there you fall. Oh, and I've lost all my marks. Right, and then when do I use a benchmark? Where, will, where am I going to use it? So those are the two little tricky points in um, when we do map work. When you, how do I read a trick beacon and how when do I use a benchmark? Right, our next one is a map reference again or in some cases they will say to you the title of the map the location of the map it's one of those things that got different kinds of names so you need to familiarize yourself with that right um and it's actually quite interesting because that thing is very very accurate and they still use it today so it's not just something that we do in class and doesn't get used at all. So it is definitely being used uh, still very, very accurate, accurately today. Right, our next one is coordinates. Right, now I always say coordinates. Why do we need coordinates? Coordinates means you need to find exactly where you're going to be. Right, today, uh, much, much easier is you've got your DPSs, you've got your satellite phones, you've got everything. So in other words, if you happen to land up in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, they will be able to find you with those coordinates. Very important, again, just a little bit of um, 
back up again. Remember, we in the south, southern hemisphere. So in other words, our line of latitude always ends with an S, south, and our line of longitude, because we are east of the Greenwich Meridian, we always end off with an E or east of it. Also, again, line of latitude first, followed by line of longitude. Right, the next one is um, a cross-section, and I'm sure everybody, I know everybody, when I say to my kids, right, we're going to do cross-section, the first thing they said, oh, ma'am, no, not again. However, it is actually quite important. Why do I need to do a cross-section? Because if I look at it, I can see something that is the reality, and I've made it smaller, that I can carry it in my pocket, right? So, in other words, I take reality and I make it smaller. And that is why we use a cross section. Right, so on your cross section, you will normally have to use a scale, right? And be careful because the cross section can be done from your topographical map, right? And your orthophoto map. So don't be caught at the end of the year or in the September exams that your teacher asked you to do the cross-section, especially because your next question, which is linked to your um, cross-section, is normally vertical exaggeration, right? So when we do our vertical exaggeration and in the next one, intervisibility, right? People always forget. And just a little tip for you when you're going to do map work, when we step off it, I always say, the minute you get your map work paper, you take a highlighter and you take each question and you highlight it and see, but which question is linked to my topographical map? Which question is linked to my orthophoto map? Because it makes a big, big difference when I start doing my calculations and also when I do my um, gradient and um, with, my, yeah, with vertical exaggeration as well. And then the last one is intervisibility. Uh, something that I always say to my kids is um, intervisibility. If I'm standing over here and you standing over there, can I see you? Now, a lot of people will just say, yes, I'm standing, but the important thing is that when we do intervisibility, you always need to draw a line. So if I've got A over here and I've got B over here, I need to take my ruler and I join the two points. And a lot of times it looks like there is nothing over there. But in actual fact, you have to go through the mountain to get to where I'm standing. All right. So that is your intervisibility. Um, with your next one is your um, interpretation, okay? Um, can we just go on? Right. Uh, there is just quickly a breakdown of your calculations. Um, something very, very important that you need to make a note of is the following. Whenever we do calculations, you need to be accurate, right? And if you speak to your educators, you will see from the report that we got back from uh, the exam is that if they measure 10.7 on the map, you are only allowed to be one millimeter out on either side. So therefore, take the time, take the time to measure accurately. Educators, teach your children how to measure accurately. That is very, very important. Right, so distance we need to do, we need to do area, then we need to do gradient, um, magnetic declination, a magnetic bearing, and vertical exaggeration. Something that I've just learned throughout the year or years is that I always teach my uh, learners no unit, no mark. Because again, we need to prepare our learners at the end of the year 
that when they go and give you distance, all right, that it is in kilometers. Distance can also be converted into meters, and sometimes it can also be given to you in hectares. So that is in distance, that is something that you need to look at. Okay, all right. So are there any questions on the map work? Um, or can I now proceed with the climatology and weather? Okay, right. We're going to start off with um, our climatology. Right, and what we're going to do with, I'm going to work with the revision mind maps. So if you can perhaps take that out, and what does it look like? It looks like this, right? It looks like this, and we're going to go through it, right? And then we're going to finish it, and then we're going to do some questions so that you can recap on what I have explained to you. All right. So first of all, let's have a look at if you go and um, I'm going to change a bit the, the format on uh, how it is on your mind map. Uh, and I'm going to start with where do we find mid-latitude cyclones. But the name itself indicates to you where it is, mid-latitude. Now, if we look at the, um, the globe as such, we've got the poles at the top, poles at the bottom, and in the middle, we have got the equator, right? So between the poles and between the equator, we have got a middle section. And if you look at that, and that is where we are going to find our mid-latitude cyclone. Now, the mid-latitude cyclone is very, very, you can see on your, um, if you look at, okay, if you look at that map over there, look very, very carefully at the two bands that you can see there, right? So the one at the south, that is where we are. Now, if you can look at it, you will see that it basically hits just South Africa, right? So now, if you go to the north and you go to the northern hemisphere, you will see quite a lot of the Europe and North America is constantly in that mid-latitude cyclone belt, if we can put it like that. So... Now, what is also very important, and this is in something that you would have remembered from last year, is the influence of the subtropical high pressure. Right now, the subtropical high pressure plays a, a very important role in our South African weather because it does two things. In summer, it goes south, and winter, it goes north. So now you can say, to you, but why does it do that? Because of the sun. What we know that is at the moment, what are we experiencing? We are experiencing winter. Why we've we got winter? Because the sun is up there, north, right? So, in other words, the rays that we are getting is has, has to travel a much longer distance, and also. From grade 10, we said, but where does the energy go? We lose it through scattering, reflection, and absorption. And the fact is that it has to travel such a long as makes it even worse for us, and that is why we will experience winter. Right. The next thing that we need to know is that if we're going to go and look at, there you go, we've got our mid-latitudes, there you've got the equator, Right, um, and then you can see exactly where we are situated in relation to the equator. Right, next one, we're going to look at the characteristics of our cold and warm front. Okay, so when we look at a cold front and a warm front, 
So where did this actually come from? Now, if you go to your at the bottom of, a, of your note, you will see there are stages of development. So go down to the bottom of your page and you will see it's number five. And there you will see we have got our five different stages before we get to the cold front. The cold front doesn't just happen. There has to be a process, right? So this process that happens is, first of all, is when we have warm and cold air moving from opposite direction towards each other. All right. So where does the warm air come from? The warm air for us comes from the equator. Where does our cold air come from? It comes from the polar area. In other words, okay, so if we go back to that one over there, right, so where does the cold air come from? The cold air, that middle latitude of ours, it's coming from the bottom, right? And it's moving towards South Africa. The warm air is coming from the equator and it's moving towards the cold air, right? So now you have this cold and warm air meeting, right? And something is then going to happen again, All right? So... When hot air and cold air meet, what do you think is going to happen? Right? We've got cold air, we've got warm air. What is going to happen? Right. Now let's look at the characteristics of the cold air and the warm air. Cold air is cold, it's heavy, it's thick, so it stays. What is warm air? Warm air is light. It's fairy. It goes up. Right? So what we're having over there is that the hot air rises. The cold air is sucked in underneath it. So when you go to your um, drawing number two on your stages, right? Number two, you will see there's a development stage. Now, that development stage, when that air starts to rise, it forms a wave, right? And that wave will keep on going and it will make these kind of waves, right? And we will also, and those waves have actually got a name. They are known as the Rossby waves. R-O-S-B-Y, Rossby waves. And these waves then develop into these big loops. And each wave has got warm air at the top, cold air at the bottom. And eventually we find that the warm and the cold air becomes such a big loop that it actually breaks off, right? So when, we, when it breaks off, we will then see that you have got this special formation of a lot a unit of cold air and a unit of warm air now i made a little placard for you so hopefully you can see what i'm trying to explain to you so that you can visualize um exactly what I'm going to explain to you here is the following. So if you take, right, so if you take, you have got your cold air, right? So you have got your cold air over here, right? It's not okay. showing it's not them showing. The okay. background. All right. So let's leave it there. Okay. I'll try and get you. So when we have this cold air, right, this cold air coming, this cold air coming over here, and then caught in between this is we've got the warm air. And when we have this definite mass of cold air with a cold front, cold air at the back, we have got a warm air, 
with the warm air and the warm front, that is when we refer to that as the mature stage. Now, that is what you see over there, right? When you see that drawing over there, that means that there is a definite cold front and there is a definite warm front. Now, also, what you need to look at is the following. Right, when you look at the front edge of the cold front, they also call it the leading edge. Now that leading edge, that cold front you can see has got a convex slope. Now that slope plays a very, very important role because in between cold front that you are, we are talking about now and the other cold front, there is warm air. And what did I say to you about warm air? Warm air is light. So if I've got a cold front over here, and I've got a cold front over here, and I've got warm air, and this one bumps into it, you're going to find that that is going to rise up. But what do we see about the slope over there? That slope is steep. So anything that is steep, it's going to go zoom up, right? It's going to zoom up there, and it's going to rise very quickly. Right? And when it rises very quickly, it cools down very quickly. And when it cools down very quickly, you find these clouds. Can you still remember from grade 10, right? Those cauliflower clouds, and those cauliflower clouds are known as cumulus clouds. But very important is that because it goes so high up into the atmosphere, it actually changes into an annual shape. So it actually, the cumulus clouds then change to cumulus nimbus cloud. Everybody still with me? Okay, right. So what do you think is now going to happen? Right, so this air is now zoomed up Okay, so that air goes up, up, up there very, very quickly. It cools down very quickly. And because it cools down so quickly, it condenses. And what do we have? All that very, very fast action gives us thunder and lightning. Remember about a week or so ago, yeah, in the middle of the night, we had that thunder and the lightning, and that's exactly what has happened over there. Right, so when we're having over there, right, so that is going up, up, up there, and we're going to have this typical convectional rain. So what is convectional rain? That is air that comes down there, down with with great force and many many times you might even have hail with that right so that gives us the cold front interesting look at the difference in temperatures okay so look at the temperature in front of the cold front so you can see there 27 24 28 right so why is that because that is in the warm air Right, look at the temperature. This is a matter of interest. What is our temperature today? I think it was 13, and we are sitting over here at the moment. Right, so we are at the back end of the cold front, and we are having 18 degrees, 14 degrees, and 16 degrees. Right, so with that, that we're going to have there, so we have now got our well-formed cold front and there we have our well-formed warm front okay now that warm front very important sits on top of the other cold front because remember that cold front has got a tail end and that one that you see over there is the tail end so it actually goes like that right so that warm front is situated on the cold air over there. Right, so eventually we're going to find that that cold air from 
this one over here is going to catch up with that cold air over there. So it pushes all that air up, and that is when we start getting our rain, our soft soaking a rain that is so familiar with the Western Cape, right? So now we have this rain that comes for days, and then we clears up, and then the next cold front comes in here, and then we go again. Right, so we're going to go to our next one. So let's look at your characteristics of your mid-latitude cyclone. First of all, we will see there very clearly, and that is something that they will ask you in the exams. They can ask you when we're going to do a synoptic chart. Later on, they can ask you how to identify what is that feature, and they can ask you what is that feature over there. Also, they can sometimes say to you what is the pressure in the inside of that particular area over there. But with this is uh, with this mature stage over there, you can also see, um, ladies and gentlemen, or educators and boys and girls, is that here you can see very very clearly the circulation pattern of the cold front. Okay, so in this circulation, you will see it's moving in a clockwise direction. Right, so it goes in a clockwise direction, and with the characteristics over there, that is your cold front, right? So that's the leading edge, and behind over there, behind over there is going to be your cold air. So that is the beginning of the cold front. That's the beginning, and you can take perhaps. Uh, if you've got a blue pen with you, um, and you can highlight that and show that that is blue, that's the beginning of the blue, right? And that is blue, everything behind it. So if we do ask in the exams, right, let's say, for instance, you are sitting over there, and we ask you, but what is the temperature going to be, or what is the weather going to be in the next 24 hours so then you know that you are going to be sitting over there. Right, then we go to this one over here, and there you see is the front of your warm front, okay? The warm front, and that again, that is the beginning of your warm air, and this air behind it is warm. So take your pencil, a pencil cone, and what you can do is you could perhaps color in that whole area over there in red, right? You can color all of that in red, and again, you will see if I am in that red area, okay, like we've seen in the previous, uh, how the temperature will change. So, this area over here, right, is also known as your warm sector area also known as the warm sector area. And then if we look at our isobars around there, our isobars are in a circular shape, right? Um, again, a concept, isobar. Okay, what is an isobar? An isobar is a line that joins all places of equal atmospheric pressure. In other words, we will see that over there, all those places over there, is the atmospheric pressure is exactly the same. Right, so what we now have is this is a well-developed mid-latitude cyclone, right? Mid-latitude cyclone. They are giving you the isobars, right? your cold front, there you've got your warm front, your clockwise um, wind circulation, there's your warm sector, and there you've got your cold sector, and we 
going to go uh, and there you can see exactly now what you perhaps can do if you want to is take a pencil and show the blue area where the blue is going to be and where the red is going to be and so your onshore wind right is going to be you your blue will be your blue arrow and your offshore winds will be your red red arrows brown and red as you can see there okay right so our next one that we're going to go to is we've just done the development like i said to you it starts with the initial stage right uh, then we have the development stage where it's find the waves there we have the mature stage with our well developed cold front well developed warm front and then we uh, get to stage number four so when these mid-latitude cyclones move along right they don't just move on right eventually you find that this one catches up with that one right and that is what I tried to do here with my poster over here, but it didn't work so lacquer. So what we have is that eventually the cold front at the back catches up with the cold front in front of it. So what actually happens is that in between air, right? So the in between air, the, the in between air, which is warm, is now actually being moved off the ground. In other words, it is dislodged, if you can put it like that, dislodged from the ground. And so what you have is that the hot air is at the top over here, and this cold front has now met up with this cold front over there, and the hot air is hovering over there. Right. When we have that, that is when we refer to as an occlusion. Again, please write in your notes the under the occlusion, you actually have two different types of occlusion. You have a warm front occlusion and you have a cold front occlusion. And that has to do and make sure that you know which one is which, because it all has to do with the a, that is the one that meeting up with in one particular case, it is cold air meeting up with the cool air. The other one is the cool air meeting up with the warm air. Right. So our next one that we're going to go to is what we are experiencing at the moment. Like I said to you, it forms these waves, right? And when we have these waves, it forms a three to four of these mid-latitude cyclones. And when we form them, or when they are formed in three or four, we refer to that as a family of cold fronts. Now, something that you need to remember with the following, when we write down with the uh, family of cold fronts. First of all, is which of these cold fronts will be the oldest and which of these cold fronts will be the youngest right so question number one is write down there if you can right um on your drawing uh where will you find the oldest cold front and where you will find the youngest cold front so the answer for the following will be the oldest is always to the east, okay? Oldest is always to the east. Why? Because the mid-latitude cyclones starts in the west and it moves to the east. Now we can take that same question and we can reverse it. And we say to you, which of these uh, cold fronts will be the youngest, right? So which one will be the youngest? It is always the one to the furthest west. Why? Because it always starts in the west and it moves to the east. In other words, if I start over here, then obviously I'm going to be the young one. And if I'm sitting over here, I'm going to be the old one. All right. So have you got that? 
So a question that they can come up in the exams is identify the oldest um, mid-latitude cyclone and identify the youngest mid-latitude mid cyclone. And actually, I'm showing the opposite wrong. So which one is the youngest, which is on the west, which is the oldest, is on the east. Right. So that is important that we know that mid-latitude cyclones always appear in families of three to four. And now you can say, but how long does this actually take? Right? They normally say in the books the whole cycle, the whole cycle from when the air meets together until it is now finished and cloud, boof, bang, it's gone, takes normally about three to 14 days. And then the whole process starts again. All right. So just to summarize quickly, the mid-latitude cyclones, we start off with the number one is the initial stage. Number two is the development stage. Number three is the mature stage. Number four is the occlusion stage. And also something that you need to remember is that, so the, is the exclusion, oh, sorry, is the occlusion stage actually the last one? No, there is actually another stage of that, and that is called the dissipating stage. So this is dissipating stage is actually the stage where it completely just fizzles out, right? You see here a cloud and there's more sunlight than clouds. So that is when this mid-latitude cyclone has completely, completely now finished and clock, right? So then if it's winter, then the whole process starts again. The warm air from the north, it's cold air from the south, meet together, the warm air start to rise, it's sucked in, and then the whole wave situation starts again. Right, so... Then quickly, cold sector, we've got the warm sector, we've got a cold sector, and there you can see um, the actual cross section. Now, great uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, or learners, shall I rather say, please make sure that you know that drawing very, very well. And also, because that drawing that you see there at the top comes back to bite you in the bum when you're going to be doing, and they ask you uh, when we go a little bit further on, we're going to see, we're going to do a synoptic chart. And they give you something like that and they say to you, all right, great tools, draw a cross section from here to here. So that is why it's very important that you get to know how to draw that cross section at the top exactly and know exactly which part of that cross section fits in with the cold front, which section fits in with the warm front, and which section sits with the back end of the previous cold front. Right, so let's go on. Okay, then also very important is the weather associated with that uh, different parts of the cold front that you see over there. Right, now, how do I remember it? Okay, how do I remember it? And I always say to my learners is that you now are writing exams and they're asking you suddenly to predict the weather that is, or describe the weather that of that particular location. And I always say to them, use, if you can't remember, look at if there is a weather station model in that particular area, because it will give you some kind of clue that you don't lose all the marks. So, so if, you, if you're sitting, for instance, in that area over there, and you can't remember what it, look for a clue. Right, and the clue might be a weather station model that is in. They might show you the wind, right? It might show you the temperature. It might show you the dew point temperature. Might show you the wind speed. 
So at least you're not just going to lose all the marks because you couldn't remember what was in your notes. Right. So that is just a little clue that I have learned throughout the years. Um, and I've taught my learners to say that if you can't remember that, look for clues on the synoptic chart that will help you to answer that. Right. So when we go on to the weather associated with it, and there you can see what I'm talking about. As I said, you can't remember. OK, you can't remember. So there exactly you're going to um, see what I am talking about. Right. So um, very, very interesting is how does it actually look like on a satellite photograph? So um, when we look at, and believe me, many, many years before I did geography, I always thought that that black area that you see on the map, that is where the clouds were, right? Until I started doing geography and I realized, oopsie, it's not that. It's actually the opposite. So over there, all that white stuff that you see there, right? That white stuff that you see over there, right? Is, and all those things over there are clouds, right? And the clouds will give you an indication of exactly what part of the mid-latitude cyclone you are actually working with. So if we go and we look at this part over here, right? if we look at that, what do you think that's going to be? Which part of the cold front that is actually going to be? Right? And if you look at it, if we go back a drawing or so, you will see that is an actual fact. Ooh, thank you. I've got a very good assistant here. Um, that yellow line that you see over there, right? That is actually the leading edge of the cold front. In other words, we know that that cold front, as it is over there, is actually moving right across South Africa, right? which means in the following a couple of days, you can see there at the back and you can see how the clouds are starting to break up, which means that that is the cold air. So we've got the cold front coming through, right? And this, at the back of the cold front, we have this cold air coming in. So we might get the rain today, right? Might get the rain today, tomorrow, but the next couple of days it is going to be freezing cold. Right. So when we look over there, right, so that area at the back you will see is breaking up of the um of the mid-latitude cyclone. So that is our cold air in the next couple of days, and therefore you're going to have to put some extra blankets onto your bed. Right. So the front part over there, you will see all those clear skies over there, the clear area over there. Now, if this is a area over there, right, you most probably will see that that is the influence of the Kalahari high pressure system. Right. So how do I know this? There are many different ideas. Uh, clues that we can use. For instance, the first thing that I will do is that if a map like that, a satellite image is given to you, you always look for the date. The first thing that you do when any synoptic chart or any satellite photograph is given to you, the first thing that you do is you look for the date, right? The date will tell you whether it is a summer map or whether it is a winter map. But Right, so then we're going to go on to our next one. Okay, there you can see exactly uh, how the movement is. There we've got our cold air. We have got our warm air, right? And now we can see exactly um, how this whole system has developed from a single cold and warm air to this whole um, section. But in your notes, I want you, um, 
in your consolidation of your there is going to be this one um there is going to be the following questions and i want you five minutes quickly to write to answer this, and it says to study figure uh, 1.4, which shows the cross section of a cold front. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right, there we've got the questions. All right. So quickly, uh, study figure 1.4, which shows the cross section of the cold front, and answer the questions that follow. Now, we're only going to do three. Because if you go through the rest of the country, you'll see they are very much the same. So I'm going to give you quickly two minutes, go through it and see if you can um, find the answer. Right, so let's go for number one. It says, give one point of evidence that A shows a cross section of a cold front. Right, so what do I need to look at? Okay, where is my cold air? Where is my warm air? Right. Um, so, am I working with a cold front uh, or am I working with a warm front? Look at the direction okay, of the moving of the air. Right, and then we're going to go to question number 1.4.2, and you'll see there we have got the cauliflower clouds, right? And we explained to you why do we have those cauliflower clouds. And remember, I said to you the other night we had our thunder and lightning. Um, so what is the reason for that? And then one, four, three. It says to you, once the cold front passes over, the air pressure will increase. Explain why this is the case. Right, so when we look at that one, what is the clue? Okay, remember when I said to you, we have got our warm air that comes from the equator and we've got the cold air from the polar area. Now, when the two meet, something's going to happen, will rise and the other one will stay behind. So where am I? in location to that A, right? Okay, so quickly. All right. You think you've got it? Okay, right. So let's go to question number 4.11. Oh, sorry, one, question 1. 1.4.1. And the first answer is going to be, it is now, please take note, write down all the different answers because sometimes that same question can count two marks. Right, so the first thing that we're going to write down there is the shape of the front, okay? So the shape of the front, the shape of the front, the shape of the front is an indication that that is a cold front, right? Okay. The second one is, <coughs> sorry, the second one is the steepness of the gradient, right? So if you look there, you will see it's got that convex slope so the steepness of the gradient that tells me that that is a cold front the third one that shows me that there is a cold front look at the clouds and i said to you there is the cumulus nimbus clouds is also there and then also very very important is look at the air behind the cold front there it is and there on the screen you will see the answers okay on the screen you will see the answers so please take all of them down as i said to you in this particular case it's only one times one but sometimes that same question can count two times one 
right? So don't just always write down one. Make sure that you have got a backup. All right. So then we go to 142. Why do cumulus clouds develop? And the answer there is, all right, so there we've got the answers over there. So again, the same as what I said to you in the previous one, don't just write down one. Have your backup. So the cold air undercuts the warm air, right? So the cold air is moving under. So cold air, warm air, warm air rises, goes up, right? So it goes up quickly, right? It's going to cool down quickly. So it cools down quickly, go down, and it rains, okay? And it rains, and it rains very, very hard. And it goes, when it goes up, it makes thunder and it makes lightning. So that is why we sometimes get this thunder and lightning in the middle of winter. And we think, but why is it there? Right. So have you got that one? Right. So um, large condensation takes place. Right. And the steep gradient causes it to go zooming up. All right. Then our question 1.4.3 is once the cold front is over, why does the pressure increase? Because we've now said we are now in the back end, right? It's cold, it's heavy, it's gooey, so it sits, right? So it is because it, it can't go zooming up, it stays over there, and therefore the pressure has changed from a low pressure now to a high pressure. Okay, now educators and learners, if you go through your notes, you will see uh, there are different questions uh, with the answers. Um, you can go through it um, because, unfortunately, we do not have time to go through all of that. However, um, if you can just look at question 1.44, right, 1.44, please take note of that particular one there. Um, if you, that is quite an important one uh, that you have got the answers for that one. And this is, it says you with, a ref ref with reference, um, write a paragraph on how the development of the cold front takes. And this is a nice question for a paragraph, right? It says you eight lines. So you've got to explain the whole situation from how it, um, it will develop. But I'm going to give you quickly just three minutes to take that particular question down. Um, and then I can quickly go and have a glass of water. Um, so can you please just take that down? Because that is a very, very important question that you know there. Okay. Just excuse me for two seconds. Yeah, okay. okay, next one, tropical cyclones. Right, when we do tropical cyclones, and I love tropical cyclones, because it is extremely, extremely fascinating, especially for us that don't always um, experience it here in uh, South Africa. Right, now, the first thing that we need to know, like I said to you, mid-latitude cyclone. Mid-latitude cyclone is in the middle. Right, Arctic, Arctic, tropical. So tropical cyclones is found in the middle, right? And the middle, um, we're going to look at that, is that when we look at the um, tropical cyclones, we need conditions that will, and I always say, let's start, how does it start? Okay, 
And that's why I say my salary is in good stead. But why will we never have a tropical cyclone here in Bloberg? Because our water is too cold, right? 16 degrees. Ooh, who wants to swim in water that's the 16 degrees? So if you go there to the middle of the tropical areas where it's 25, 27, it's lovely. You can swim a whole day. So that is number one. We need what are the conditions that we need for a tropical cyclone to develop? Right. Temperature is the utmost because why? Because it needs the temperature is the, I always say it's the petrol of the engine. Right? Because what happens to hot air? We've just spoken about it. Hot air rises. Okay. So it goes zooming up. Right. And because it goes up, it cools down, right? And again, this whole process is taking part, taking place very, very quickly. So everything is quick, 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 right? So what we find is that this air, as it goes up into the atmosphere, it then starts to divert, right? Now, somewhere along the line, you heard or you were taught the concept Coriolis force, right? So what is Coriolis force? Coriolis force is the force that deflects wind, right? Remember that. Coriolis force is a force that deflects wind. It does not, and take note, it does not affect the speed of the wind. What affects the speed of the wind? Make a note, ask your teacher, right? So what affects Coriolis only affects the direction or the deflection of the wind. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's always deflected to the left. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's deflected to the right. Okay, so once we have that, is this air that's going up, right? It is a very hot. Uh, and it gets thrown sideways, right? And when we look at this, uh, with this air that goes up, it makes this, I always say it's like a vacuum. It sucks out all the air. So that sucking out of the air in this middle creates a low pressure, right? And that low pressure can sometimes go below 950 hectopascals. Right, so now we have got all the ingredients for a tropical cyclone to develop. So where do we find them? Okay, let's have a look there quickly, very briefly. Um, and you can see uh, in different parts of the world, they've got different names, right? So in, in, um, in America, it's known as the hurricanes. If you in Asia, it's a typhoon. If you are in Southern Hemisphere, we know it as a tropical cyclone. And also, I always tell my kids in Australia, it used to call, be called the willy willy. Right? And then everybody laughs. And whether it's still like that, I've actually looked it up. I can't find that, but maybe they still call it. But in any case, let's have a look quickly. It always develops on the east coast of the continent. Now we're going to look here in South Africa, and this is why you can see that we don't always have the effect of it. We to the south don't have it. But to the north, for example, um, uh, Mozambique, the northern parts of South Africa, they, have, uh, they will experience it. Right, so what are the uh, tropical cyclones? The characteristics occurs in a tropical area. It moves from east to west, and it always forms a path, all right? So it moves away from the equator. And then we see that also very important that you need to remember is that a tropical cyclone never starts as a tropical cyclone. It starts as a tropical storm. And that is when they go and they upgrade it. So it changes from a tropical storm to a tropical cyclone. What is also so, I won't say good, but it is a tropical cyclone can be upgraded and it can be downgraded. So many, many times if you listen to the radio, you will see 
that they are saying that there's a tropical storm and it is now category one, the category two, and then suddenly, boof, it shows, it's go back to, because the conditions has changed. Right, so if we look at it quickly, so we will see that the tropical cyclone moves from east to west, and as it moves, it will go along, it picks up more energy, and where does the energy come from? It comes from the water, and as it goes along, you will see that it moves towards the land. Right, when it gets to the land, right, uh, you're going to see in your tropical cyclone, tropical cyclones, the same thing as the mid-latitude cyclone, have got sections, right? The tropical cyclone's got a front section, it's got a middle section, and it's got a back section. The front section is the worst, right, or the front quarter, or quadrant, okay, or the southwest quadrant. Now, that particular area is where most of the damage starts in because that is where the wind is very strong. So as it moves towards the towards land, right, and as soon as that part goes over the land, it cuts off the energy. So there's no more water, no more petrol. So what happens? And that is one of the questions that we normally ask in anyway, Why does a tropical cyclone break down or dissipate or disappear when it hits land? Because its petrol is cut off. Right? or its energy is cut off. There is no more water, so there is no more evaporation, there is no more humidity. So what we have is that uh, that area over there will break up. So what are the what what are the consequences of a tropical cyclone? Tropical cyclones have got primary effects and have got secondary effects. Primary effects is what happens there, and you will see the on your note you will see destruction, storm winds, torrential rains, and flooding, right? That are your primary effects of a tropical cyclone. Secondary is, is the things that happen because of that, right? So, for instance, with storm winds, right, so what will a very, very strong wind? It will take off roofs, right? It will damage your telephone lines and things like that. So, that is what we need to know about your um, the effects of your tropical cyclone, but also what is important that we know is that tropical cyclones can affect either your economics of a country or it can affect the humans of them. And if you're going to go and look in your notes, you will see the impact of the tropical cyclones, which is number six, right? And there you will see very, very clearly um, what are the primary and the secondary effects of a tropical cyclone. The other thing is, uh, in contrary to um, our mid-latitude cyclone, is how do we prepare? And if you look many times on TV, when there is, especially in America, you will see how they, you put it on CNN and you'll see how people are boarding up their windows. They are tying the, um, they are tying the um, chairs and everything. So because that is how they prepare themselves to minimize the, um, the minimize the damage. Right. So when we look at there, you can see the storm. Um, there you can see the flooding, right, and great swirls and waves. And uh, like, for instance, as I said, that is the difference between, I always say the difference between a tropical cyclone and a tornado, right? Tropical cyclone, you can warn people. You can tell them, get out, right, move to another place. Get yourself some food and water, right? Nine out of ten times it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but that is very important. A tropical cyclone, you can warn people, right? So you can protect yourself, right? So like I said to you, it can be environmental, it can be economic, it can be human factors that is affected by the tropical cyclones. All right, so I am now going a little bit quick. Um, so if we just look at the different stages of the there, again, is the formative, the immature, 
uh, your mature stage. And you will also see is one of the questions they like asking is, when do I know that it is a mature stage of a tropical cyclone? So make a note of that question. When do I know that it is a mature stage of a tropical cyclone? Okay, then this is also a very nice um, little diagram that we as educators like to ask in the exams is, uh, and this is a, a higher grade question because this is interpretation. And if you look at it, you will see, I can ask you, uh, for instance, why is the, if you divide it into different sections and we say to you, uh, that is A and that's B and that's C, and that's D and that's E. And we explained and we say to you, but why is the wind speed so high or lower over there? Why is it over there? Why is it high over there? What is that section called over there? Um, and especially this, the, the conditions around the eye, okay? It's very, very important that you know, but why is the wind so strong over there? Why is it clear skies over there, right? So take note of that. So why is it clear over here? And that is also, in, uh, it's always mind boggling to me, is that in areas where, where people have tropical cyclone and people come out when, people come out when there is a, the eye is passing over it. So the eye is very, very important that you know um, what the conditions in and around the eye is. Okay, so that is a higher grade question. Um, so you have to apply your knowledge to answer A, B, C, or D. Okay, right, so let's move on. So there you will see uh, the conditions before the eye, during the eye, and after the eye. Okay, have you all got that? Right, then the management, which I spoke to you about, is um, the strategies. Okay, how do I pro uh, uh, protect myself? And like I said to you, also very important is that we can manage it, right? Very important is that a tropical cyclone can be managed, right? Okay, right. So we are now flying like a rocket. Okay, there quickly, just one last thing is um, on a tropical cyclone, you will see there's a name, right? So what is it? Why is there a name on it, right? The name tells you something, right? So I always use the example Doris. I say, I always say to my grade 10 or 12 learners, I said, uh, what, what does Doris mean to you, right? Doris means A, B, C, D. Doris is number four. In this particular one, it is Elaine, right? So Elaine is A, B, C, D, E. The fifth tropical cyclone of, and take note of that season, right? Every year, tropical cyclones get names. Right? How they get names, that's a different story. Can I ask your teacher, right, to explain to you how those names are made up. Very, very important is that the name indicates to you what number of tropical cyclone is that one of the particular season. Take note also, and don't let them catch you. And the question that we normally ask you, how many tropical cyclones, and I will repeat that again, how many tropical cyclones have there been before Elaine? Right? Shall I repeat that again? How many tropical cyclones have there been before Elaine? Right? You work that one out. Okay. So have you got that? Right. So the name we've got, we can see it is it moves in a clockwise direction. Also very important is that we know the sign, okay? That little sign that you have that indicates you a tropical cyclone, it looks like a little windmill, 
please make sure that you know how to indicate that because that has been asked in the exams already. So if you look carefully there next to Elaine, it looks like a doiki with an S. I always say just make an S and you put the doiki in the middle or a little dot in the middle. Right. There we go. So tropical cyclones. Quickly, if we look at it, very nice. You can see that straight away. And there um, we just going to, there you can see where the eye is, right? You can see the eye very, very clearly. And that is one of the differences between a mid-latitude cyclone and a tropical cyclone. Right, so questions quickly. Uh, we say to you, identify the type of cyclone represented in the satellite image. And I always say to my kids, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, educators, it always looks like a twirly whirly ice cream, right? When you look at it from the top and it looks like somebody has made an ice cream and there's a little hole in the middle, that is your tropical cyclone. The one thing that we can ask you from that tropical cyclone, if you look at the air, right, from that we can ask you, is that tropical cyclone in the northern hemisphere or in a southern hemisphere? So what is the difference? Okay, please write this down. That a tropical cyclone in the northern hemisphere is in the opposite direction to what we have in the Northern Hemisphere is different to what we have in the Southern Hemisphere. Southern Hemisphere, always clockwise. Northern Hemisphere, anti-clockwise. Okay, so we're not going to go through all of those. Uh, the important thing is, like I said to you, the important things that you need to know uh, is um, the conditions and the what is the low pressure systems and the clouds and conditions, the precautions, strategies, management, those are the things that is in your notes. Those are a very, very good summary of what you can do for tropical cyclones. Okay, right. We're going to move on to the next one. We're going to, there it, again, it just gives you an idea of the tropical cyclone. There is a particular one. We're going to ask you there, is that one in the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere? And again, you will look at, um, uh, look at the, the direction of how we are putting the arrows in, and that will give you an idea of where we are, or where the Northern Hemisphere, or whether we are, in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, right, so let's finish there quickly. Right, now, this one um, is the effective of tracking the cyclones. Now, um, the economic and environmental impact, that is what I spoke to you, but I just want to come back because when I did this last night, I thought this is a very good, nice, or very good question for GIS, right? So it says to you there, explain why satellite images are effective by tracking cyclones. Now, I know I'm going a little bit off the track here, but when we look at satellite images, that brings us back to when we're going to do GIS, right? So why do we use um, a satellite? To, for remote sensing, okay? So when we have remote sensing, Okay, so just keep that in mind. I'm not going to go on too much. Is that that satellite is remote sensing. That remote sensor that you have there is active and passive, right? You can see there exactly, and this is why I say you can predict the path. They can tell the people, move out, right? So that is why this collecting it from the satellite is I can collect the data, right? I can prepare, I can predict, and I can make, and always I like with the DJs, is to make an informed decision for people to go where. All right. So that is why um, question two, three, four for me is important. 
satellite is it links you with your GIS. Okay, right. So there you can just go through the data um, and the economic impact, uh, the environmental impact, and then very, very important is this, that, all right? Any four should refer to both economic and environmental. Take note. You can't just go and give me, not me, but at the end of the year, four of economic. It has to be two of the one and two of the other because the question is twofold, right? So please make a big NB next to that is to take note of the wording. It is question, environmental and economic. So you have to answer both, okay? Very important. Okay, so that is um, what we need to know about the tropical cyclones. And then our next one is, and I actually going to leave the questions and I want to go to, okay. Factors that influence climate of South Africa, right? Um, when we look at the factors, I always say these three things that affects uh, factors or affects the climate of South Africa. Number one is your ocean currents. Okay, there you can see it. Ocean currents is the warm Mozambique and the warmer Gullis. So, in other words, the eastern part of South Africa has got a warm ocean current. What do we know about warm ocean currents? It will evaporate. So when it evaporates, it will rain. So that air then blows into the interior of South Africa and something is going to happen and we might get rain. Now we go to the western part of South Africa and we look at that one and where we have got the cold Benguela current. Now that Benguela current is cold. And what did I say to you about cold? Cold air is, yeah, it stays. It doesn't want to move. Right, so it just hangs over the west coast over here. Where on the east coast, the air is going zip, 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 zip. Yeah, it's going right. Now, what is the next thing is? So ocean currents is one factor. Then we went and, and if we look at the build of South Africa, we have got a escarpment. Our country has made, is made up of a coastal plain, an escarpment, a plateau and another escarpment. And that, our actual physical build plays an important role. So the eastern part of South Africa, the eastern part of South Africa where the Drakensberg is, that is much higher. So therefore that warm fluffy air goes there, it goes zoops, it goes up, it rains. So how does the east coast have? East coast got rain. Go to the west coast, here is the plateau, but the plateau over here is not very high. So it goes over the plateau, and it, before it realized, oopsie, I need to rain, it's gone. So what is the air like? And the conditions on the west coast? Dry, right? You know it. You go up the west coast, there's hardly any trees and things. We just see sand. And then that last one, number three, is the position of the high pressure system. Now, covered that last year in uh, grade 11, when we did primary circulations and we learned about the influence of the South Atlantic high pressure, the Kalahari high pressure, and the South Indian high pressure. But in these three high pressures perform differently during different times of the year. In summer, the South Atlantic goes waltzing down there to the poles, so it allows the cold fronts to, that's why we don't get rain in, in summer. Where is the South Atlantic sitting now? Just up the road, yeah, right? So it's moved up. So what is happening to the cold fronts? The cold fronts are coming over us, right? Why are we getting rain? It's because these cold fronts are coming over us, right? Go to the uh, Kalahari high pressure. Kalahari high pressure in winter. Inside South Africa, plateau, right? Far from the sea, right? Sea's got no influence on this on the on the plateau. So 
during the day, it gets very hot. And at night, it gets very cold. Well, I won't say very hot, but it gets hot, right? Why is it cold so cold? Because of one thing, right? And please remember this, Kalahari high pressure. The important thing there is terrestrial radiation. So at night, when it is been warm, it is nice and warm, 2021, and then suddenly tonight the temperature drops, poof, to minus two, minus three. Why? Because of terrestrial radiation. In the South Indian high pressure, we find, I always say it's like a loose one. It moves in and up and down. Uh, but the two that has got a great, great influence on the South African weather is the South Atlantic, the Kalahari, the South Indian high pressure, please write this down, is more of a blocking, right? Take note, it is a blocking high pressure. It blocks, it blocks. So when you have the cold front coming from the west and it goes over the country and it, the Indian is over here, will block it and then it goes push the mid-latitude cyclone even further. So that is... Uh, educators and learners, that gives us our three factors that influence the temperature of South Africa. So if we look at that one there very quickly. All right, so we can see there's the cold air, right? Um, no, yeah, that we are actually looking there. Um, that is what we will find in summer, right? So in summer, we have the opposite to what we have in winter. In summer, we find that the Kalahari high pressure actually dissipates, right? And in actual fact, I won't say it dissipates, it moves. It doesn't move, it doesn't disappear, it moves up, right? So when it moves up, it creates this vacuum at the bottom and i always say it looks like three little little circles and that is where you will remember your teacher or your educator might have spoken to you and told you about the heat lows that develop so the heat lows that develop over the interior of south africa is this low low pressure so it sucks in the air it sucks in the air from over the in over the 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 uh, sorry the Indian Ocean. So it goes that is hot and moist. So it goes into the interior, and there you can see for yourself we have the cold air. Sometimes meet up with that warm air, and it rises up there. And why do we call it a line of thunderstorms? Because they literally develop in a line in a northwest southeasterly direction. So it runs all the way from Namibia all the way down to Port Elizabeth. That is how your line thunderstorms. And that is why you will see many times on the weather bureau or you see the weather at night and it you will see the can you need to make a so over there, you will see how they indicated on the uh, on the weather uh, maps during summer how this line of thunderstorms actually run from a northwest to a southeasterly direction. Okay, so that is there. You can see then our next one is our berg winds, right? Very very important, and this is something that is happening at, at the moment. Right, if you look at any synoptic chart at the moment, you will see that the inside of South Africa or our interior, we have got a very, very strong uh, high pressure, or which is the Kalahari high pressure, which is situated over there. And then we find that because of the cold front, it forms a coastal low that moves all the way from the west coast, right? So low pressure over the sea, right? And it moves um, all the way from the west coast towards the east coast. And as it moves towards the east coast, right, this actual system becomes stronger 
and stronger. And one of the big thing is because it becomes stronger, the offshore winds, right? The winds that blow from the land to the sea, by the time it gets to Durban and those areas, that wind is bone, bone dry. So it dries up the felt and it just needs something to cause a spark. And then that fault starts to burn and it can burn like what is happening at this very moment. Uh, how many sheep was uh, burned and cattle and infrastructure was uh, damaged with the wind that occurred um, over the last couple of days. Right. So important thing that you need to remember there with burp winds is if you can make a note is how it is formed. Okay how it is formed, and secondly is the impact, right? The impact that uh, Bergwins have on the economic impact and the human impact um, of cool. the Bergwins, right? Okay, right, so there just uh, your little bit of exercises that you can look at uh, the typical kind of question that we will ask Name the uh, high pressure, um, <clears throat> sorry, very, very important is the season, okay? So number, the second one, in which season do wind, uh, bird winds generally occur, right? And please take note, it is winter, right? So there you have the um, answers, Kalahari high pressure, winter, okay? And there we have got why do we have, and that is exactly what I explained to you, is because of the air coming over the escarpment, which is descending air. And whenever air is descending, right, when it's pushed down, it warms up. Why does it warm up? Because of friction. Okay, right, let's move on. Okay, there you will find your answers uh, for um the following stuff right now the following two concepts is and i find them they are very important for map work number one is aspects right and the other one is a valley and mountain breeze now we can incorporate this in your map work so please take note uh, because many times we can ask you, um, we can actually ask you how to link the topography um, with the, or, and actually like not the topography, the slope, uh, north facing slope or south facing slope. Why do you have vineyards on this side, but on this side you have got uh, factories and stuff like that, and that is how we will bring in the aspect um, in the map work part as well. Then when you have your catabatic and anabatic winds, um, how will we bring that in? Uh, it normally will come in with the agriculture, and we will say to you, why is it going to be difficult, or what are the problems that farmers will experience in uh, the valleys and and what is the reason and uh, the important thing is that you will then excite you that there is the frost pocket right and the frost pocket is will cause frost and your crops will die and also obviously if something happens how am i going to prevent it so i need to have my precaution measures put in place as well Okay, so we're going to go there. Uh, you've got your inversion. So important is the following, the concept inversion. What does that mean? Inversion is the opposite to your normal temperature. What is normal temperature? The higher you go, the colder it gets, right? So that is your normal conditions. The higher we go, the colder it gets. However, inversion, it's the opposite. Inversion means opposite. So inversion means the following. The higher I go, the temperature increases. So the temperature can only increase if something there is. So the air is going up 
right? Air is going up, but it's not cooling down. It is actually staying or even hotter. And the only reason can be is something blocking it. And what is that? That can be different things. For instance, in cities, we can have fog, and that brings us, oh, sorry, not fog, um, um, smoke, smog, all of those kind of things, and they will actually form this layer, and this terrestrial radiation can't break through it. Okay, so there we have catabatic and anabatic winds, cool. inversion. Okay, right, so um, we're going to our last one is um, temperature inversion in your valleys. And there again, um, ladies and gentlemen, you we can apply that to the map work and we can say to you uh, what are the possible, if there is a residential area, if there's a residential in the areas over there, and then you've got a factory there. What are the problems that the people are going to experience over there? So those are the kind of things where you need your, your knowledge to apply it. To. So it's a little bit of an insight um, question, um, the higher grade question that we can do there. Okay, right. Then we're going to go on to our... Next one over there, so we can just show your catabatic winds, uh, how that is responsible for it. Okay, also known as your gravity winds, and there you can see how it affects your farming and your settlement. Okay, right. So there are your things that you can see. Also very important is um, on A and B is identify uh, the winds in A and B. Um, possible questions that we can ask you is, for instance, uh, there is a state one difference between the winds. That is very, very important, okay? Uh, I like asking that one is, what are the difference between one and two? And there are three very basic questions, um, three basic answers, right? So the answers to that one will be, right, there you go, anabatic, catabatic, day and night, day and night, cold and warm air, up and down. Easy question to remember, right? And easy marks. I call these things easy marks. So what is the difference between a catabatic, anabatic? That are, those are the three or four words that you need to remember. Okay, right, there we go with that. Right, now, our last section. Heat islands and, um, sorry, just see, ma'am, how much time do I have? Um, 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Okay, last one. Difference between um, your temperature inside the city and outside the city. Now, with the drawings that I, okay, what are, okay, the picture that you see there tells you a lot of info or gives you a lot of information. Right, so the first one, if we go to the top drawing, you'll see the suburban areas and then you see urban areas. Right, now, look at the picture. When you look at the suburban area, you see this one little house and it's covered in ground or grass or a field or a felt or whatever you want to call it. However, we go to the drawing next to it. But look carefully there. When you look at it, you will see all the buildings on top of each other. Right? So straight away, that must be a difference or there must be a difference. So let's have a look at what is this, what does the city actually look like from inside? <laughs> First of all, when we, when we look at the city, you will see it's got tall buildings, and that is a very important thing, right? The temperature in the city, <coughs> the temperature in the city is all because of those tall buildings, right? Secondly, buildings are tall. 
Secondly, they are very close together. Right? In other words, when you are standing close together, you get very warm. Right? If you stand far apart from each other, you're not so warm. Right? So the fact is that these buildings on top of each other makes or plays a very important role. The fact is that they are very tall also play a very important role. The third thing is, what are these buildings made up of? Plenty of glass, plenty of concrete, plenty of tar. So everything that it is made up is either holding heat, right, or giving it off, reflection. So when we look at the CBD, right, which is that area where we have all these big, tall buildings now, the CBD, you people will do most probably in your settlement geography where you do the different land zones. And there you will see how that will join up with this again. So how this the settlement geography will, exp will help you to understand the climate of the city. Right, so now we've got these tall buildings. We are they're on top of each other. They made out of concrete. You've got plenty of tar. There's hardly any trees. Maybe here and there, there's a pot. Um, and so the important thing is that the heat is trapped in that particular area. Now, if you go to the other side of the picture, right? I said to you, you've got the house surrounded by the area. Straight away, you can see there's going to be a difference. Right? The difference in, and that is going to create that concept that we talk about, the urban heat island. Okay, have you got that? The urban heat island. So why is it an island? Because if you look at the structure of the city, you will see you can identify the CBD anywhere in the world because it's always got the tallest buildings, right? So because it's got the ta tallest buildings, it actually creates this urban heat island. Now, because the heat is trapped in that area, during the day, it will go, the heat gives off, so this heat goes up, and then eventually, depending again, and that is where aspects come in, right? So if you happen to be in a valley, right, that is going to go up. But just before it gets warm enough, it's getting nighttime again. So that air that is warmed up now cools down. So where it was going up, it now does this. So it forms a dome. So that dome that is formed is made up of that gas and all that haha -ha stuff that went up there, your smog, your car fumes, and all those kind of things. And they now, tonight, when it gets six o'clock, seven o'clock, and everything starts to get cold, it forms this dome. And what is this dome called? The pollution dome, right? And if you stay in Johannesburg, right, you can actually smell it. When you wake up in the morning, especially in winter, and you can actually smell it, right? Yeah, in Cape Town, we don't see it always. We see it, but we don't always smell it. So this heat island is the area, right, where you have the buildings, high buildings, close together, type of material, cars, lack of uh, vegetation, that creates my heat island. And that heat island then gives off my gases and stuff like that. That starts to rise. And then tonight it gets cold and it goes boink, back to that pollution dome. Got it? Right. So why is the temperature? Now, how do we measure temperature? We have got something which is called an isotherm, right? What is an isotherm? Isotherm, if you don't know it, is a line that joins all places of equal 
temperature. Okay, I'll repeat it again. An isotherm is a line that joins all places of equal temperature. Now, the question that they say to ask you there is why are the isotherms not all in a straight line or concentric? Of? And now we go back to our drawing right at the beginning. And if you look at it, if you look at it in the middle, you will see there's my CBD. Okay. So what did we learn about the CBD? Temperatures, building, density, all those settings. And then I go a little bit further out and I see, but I've only got my one house again. So is the temperature inside the CBD and the temperature outside it's that's going to be exactly the same? No. Right. So the answer therefore is that in the CBD, right, where the temperature is the highest, it will trap the heat. Therefore, my temperature will be higher. Why is the temperature? Because it's further apart and the energy can move around and it can become cooler. Right. So there you have got the two possible reasons why the isobars in the city is not in concentrical isotherm lines. Right. Okay. Then. Nearly there, and we are nearly at the end. So if there are any questions in terms of the CBG, please, uh, you can ask now. Okay, so and then the last thing that we're going to do is quickly the synoptic chart, right? So there we've got all of that. Okay, we've got the surrounding the areas and then Okay, right. So um, again, just a whole lot of questions that will help you with temperature inversion to show you how that will contribute towards the heat island and now we're going to go to our last one, and that is our synoptic chart. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what is very important is that you know the following, right? When you look at your weather station model, people are asking this. So don't throw marks away because you don't know how to read a weather station model. The first thing that you need to do is, and I always say we start with the middle, right? When we look at the middle, Right, that one over there represents your cloud cover. Now, there at the top, you will see your different types of cloud cover. Do yourself a favor and go and learn it. Right. Uh, also, very important is that um, you can see. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, way back now. Okay, you can see for yourself when we uh, do the coloring in of the cloud cover, it is always done in a clockwise direction, right? So the first quarter, then it's a half, then it's three quarter, then it's overcast, which is a full circle then. Right, next one is our temperature. Take note, temperature is we use two types of temperature. Temperature, maximum temperature, and the one that is lower is dew point temperature, NB, NB, very important. Not minimum temperature, but dew point temperature. There's a big difference between dew point temperature and minimum temperature. So two things, maximum temperature, Dew point temperature. Now, remember, when we ask you to write it down, you always need to give me the unit, not me, but whenever you write, you have to give the unit. So what is 20 degrees? 20 degrees Celsius. We use the unit Celsius. Right. So no unit, no mark. That's what I teach my children. So get used to it. Always give the unit. Right, then our next one that we're going to go is wind. Right, wind direction and wind speed. Very important. 
is how does a wind get its name? Right? How does a wind get its name? A wind always gets its name from the direction where it comes from. Okay, take note. So in other words, if you look at that wind over there, right? The wind that's over there is a south easterly wind, right? But wind also, not all the winds are some days. The wind is taking the roof off and the other days it's beautiful. So that is wind speed. So wind speed, there you can see for yourself, uh, we have got a long line, right, which represents 10 knots, and then a smaller one, which is half of 10, which is five. But take note of the following. So what happens now if it's not 10 or not 15, but it's actually a five? So that is the one at the bottom, the, the five knot, that is how we will indicate that. Right, and then the other one is the um, weather conditions, right? Weather conditions, again, it's something you need to learn, and that is the three lines is fog and drizzle, rain, uh, snow, showers, and thunderstorms. Now, all of that, um, ladies and gentlemen, is something that can be asked, right? Because our next thing, when we look at our synoptic chart, right, you will see there we can give you all the features that you need to know and make sure, make sure that you make a point of it and go and learn your synoptic chart very, very well. These are easy marks, right? Easy marks. The other thing that you need to just remember is how do I know this is a summer map or this is a winter map? Please go and look at that, right? But the first thing I want to say to you is that when a question like that has been asked, and I've already spoken to you about it, I said the first thing that you do is you always look for the date, right? And that is many, many times I sit in my class and I've given it to my, and I, the first thing and I say to them, okay, what type of, what season was this? And then I say then the date and then how many of them say, um, oh man, we never looked at that. We didn't see that. So it's the most obvious one, right? The most obvious that in the easiest one, that is how you will identify the season of the map and then you can go and look at the other things like the temperature position of the um, high pressure systems and so forth all right and then we're going to end off there quickly how to interpret the satellite image and now we've done that already to a certain extent because when we did um, the mid-latitude cyclones I spoke about that right don't make the same mistake as what I did and thought that the black areas were were the uh, cloudy areas. So the black are actually clear skies. And wherever you see the white, that is our clouds. And it shows you the thickness. And um, and even if you if you get a um, app, there's an app. Uh, where you can see if it's low clouds or high clouds or middle clouds. So thank you very much and have a lovely day.